Hello, welcome to today's GigaArm Research webinar, which is all about why content co-location hosting and large enterprises are building their own networks versus uh, buying lease lines from carriers. My name is Joe Maitland. Um, I will be your moderator for today. And uh, to start off the event, we'll, we'll go and do a round of introductions with all our panelists. Uh, then we'll hear a message from BTI Systems, who's our sponsor. Thank you very much, BTI. Uh, and then we'll dig into the heart of the, the topic today, which is what are the trigger points for building versus buying your network? So, so where's the tipping point when, comp when this actually makes sense for, for different kinds of companies to move in this direction? Uh, we'll uh, think about the considerations for purchasing dark fiber, so technical, financial, and operational um, issues that, that, that may come up when you go down this path. And then the challenges of building uh, this kind of um, connectivity yourself. Uh, what does it mean from a sort of skill set point of view? And, uh, and what does it mean kind of operationally to do this? There is a Q&A function you guys will see um, for the audience. There's a question section. Feel free to ask questions in that, in that, um, that panel on the side of your screen there as we go through the webinar. Uh, we'll probably wait and do the Q&A at the end. Um, and if we don't get to address all of your questions, we will certainly pass those along to our panelists today, and, and they will answer those at a later time for you. So certainly feel free to sort of chime in whenever you like. Um, we will eventually get to all those questions. There's also a couple of polls, um, poll questions that we're going to ask throughout the webinar. Those are interactive. Please take the polls. Um, we're going to discuss those results live and see where you guys are um, on this kind of debate and, and conversation. Um, it's obviously a you know, relatively small sample size, but it's still sort of interesting for, for conversation. Um, and uh, so without further ado, again, my name is Joe Maitland. Um, I'm your moderator for this event. Um, I'm the research director for infrastructure um, at GigaOM Research. And uh, I also wear an analyst hat here too at the company, so I do all the usual sort of analyst um, stuff as well. Greg, over to you. Hi everybody, my name's Greg Farrow. You may know me as the voice of the Packet Pushers podcast and also from my blog and writing at GigaOM Pro. Uh, I am a professional network engineer in my main existence and I'm looking forward to talking about networking with the audience today. Thanks. And Randy? Thank you, Joe. Randy Niels uh, with Rackspace and uh, managing network strategy and sourcing at Rackspace, uh, growing our, our networks around the world. Cool, thank you. And Eve, over to you. Thanks, Joe. Eve Grillicus, I'm the Director of Solutions Marketing for BTI Systems. So I'll, I'll get things kicked off here, and uh, some of you may uh, not be familiar with BTI, um, and, but we're a small company with a lot of momentum right now, so I uh, just wanted to let you know that we're the leading provider of networking infrastructure for cloud solutions today. Um, the Intelligent Cloud Connect is an uh, overall architecture which we support, which is an open IP and optical networking platform that enables content providers, cloud providers, co-location, and service providers to scale their networks and begin to really monetize their networks. We've demonstrated that we're a global company with over 380 customers worldwide, and we've got organic revenue growth but are also backed by a team of experienced folks uh, such as Bain Capital and, and others. Joe, if you could go to the next slide. Sure. Wanted to show you what the BTI deployments are in major cloud data center hubs. As you can see here, BTI is a global company with uh, many of the major data center hubs uh, today. We've got multiple deployments in North America, London, Sydney, with Rackspace. We've got multiple deployments in, across Asia with Equinix, and we've got a growing network in Russia with VK that we've announced, which is the largest social networking site in Eastern Europe. And we also have customers such as Digital Realty Trust and Epsilon that are powering sort of very large connectivity sites all over Western Europe. Joe, the next slide. So here's where we sort of get to the meat of what we wanted to talk about today, which are the challenges that are faced by content hosting and co-location providers. 
which is honestly that there is a real lack of control when you're leasing managed waves from service providers. There's a bit of a slow service and lack of urgency or an inability to deliver wavelengths fast enough. The cost is extremely linear. As you add a 10 gig wave, you pay for yet another 10 gig wave. There's no packaging or deals, and it's all on a monthly basis, and it tends to be incremental. And I think as Randy will talk, there's some hidden fees along with uh, just the lease line. And there's also a need to improve user experience. Um, there's uh, some some of these guys carry a lot care a lot about latency. Some do not. But where latency is important, it's very important to build your own network to improve that. And as providers are expanding data centers, uh, the space and the power become even more limited as they're moving into the urban environments where things are extremely tight, fiber is more expensive and data center co-location sites are much more rare. Also what we're saying is that um, in order to build out a network today, the operations are, have to be with very small teams. And what we're seeing with some of the um, content and hosting and co-location providers is that they need help in building out their networks and they don't want to do it with increasing their operational costs. They want them, they want them to remain fairly flat. So the question is, how does one go about assessing how to build their own network? Um, if you look at the map on the right, there's a, a bunch of different things. It obviously depends on where you are in the world. The pricing could be very different, but you have to look at the dark fiber costs in the metro and the long haul. You have to take what your bandwidth usage is today in any given spot, and you have to have some type of forecast for that bandwidth. At that point, you can pretty much evaluate where the breaking point will be for the cost of the managed service versus building it out yourself. What we found so far today in general is in the metro area, the breaking point is about 40 gig. I don't want to take any more time talking about BT. I want you to hear from some of our customers and the analysts. So Joe, I'm going to send it right back to you. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Eve. Thanks for uh, kicking off the topic uh, so well there. So I want to get the audience <clears throat> engaged right away. We're going to launch a, a poll for you guys. The question, um, the question is, are you planning on moving from least wave to, uh, to building your own network? Um, so we'll get that poll going. Eve, while uh, while the while the audience is taking that, um, is it? I mean, among your sort of 300 plus, you know, getting on for 400 customers, is this a trend that is sort of slowly on the rise, kind of, or, or you know, rapidly escalating among you know among colos and and content companies? What sort of of that of that customer base of yours, you know, how how common is this? I think it's becoming more and more common all the time. Actually, we saw quite a few enterprise uh, customers start to build their own networks out um, a few years ago, and that's extended to the hosting and co-location and obviously the content providers. Um, the trigger points are, are really um, can be um, in a specific area as well. It doesn't have to be a decision that incorporates the entire network. Uh, what may happen is you may have a specific city where the capacity is growing and the interconnect is simply uh, forecasted to grow so much that it just makes more sense to trigger over. And so that's what we're seeing are pockets of higher capacity, especially where there are data center um, sort of uh, consolidation areas. Uh, you know, some of those are Germany, Los Angeles, uh, the UK, uh, where there's just a lot of data center consolidation in New York City. Uh, where that triggers are are easily to happen. Right. So just uh, sort of sharing the results here. Um, so about so 30% of the audience saying yes. You know this is definitely in our roadmap. Um, big portion though saying not yet. So maybe we'll dig into uh, to sort of some of those reasons why uh, this is this is possibly still early. So I, I want to uh, kind of get you involved here, Randy, on you know on Eve's point about sort of, you know, you don't necessarily lay dark fiber everywhere. What's Rackspace's approach to, uh, to when you do, um, you know, buy dark fiber versus using leased lines? How do you, how do you weigh that, that benefit? 
thank you. Yes, you've identified that it, it does require a minimum base amount of capacity where it makes uh, then sense to look at the cost of leasing that over time uh, as, as lit capacity or, or leasing fiber or other, other ways of acquiring the fiber. There are some capital lease type structures. Uh, so in our, in our case, we would look at larger metros where we have one data center and maybe uh, a couple of carrier hotels that we need to reach where we've got a significant amount of bandwidth and a trajectory that's growing. Um, and then the second case is when we uh, reach capacity of a data center, which we have in several of our markets and need to expand beyond one or two data centers to the third or fourth, uh, linking those together and supporting those data centers with dark fiber has proven very valuable for us, uh, particularly with the growth of data replication traffic uh, between data centers. Cool, Greg, you know, thinking about the sort of uh, the time frame to purchase leased lines, it sounds like that's, that's sort of a part of the issue here is that just getting, you know, capacity up and running in a time frame that you want is, is one, one reason why people might start to look at dark fiber. Is that, is that true? Like what is, what's the yeah, issue there sure around is. purchasing leased lines? It sure is. It's a massive problem. Engaging the process to, you know, from the process where you have a need, you identify a need, then you have to go through and engage a carrier. The carrier must do a systems check to confirm that they've got the available bandwidth. They come back to you and say, yes, we can do this. You want 10, 20, 40 gigs. Then you say, okay, now give me a price. And then there's, you know, and then the provisioning, it's, you're often talking three months for the initial engagement and three months for the deployment. And of course, in the, in the current era of deployments, we need things to be done in weeks or days, not months or years, which is quite often where the carriers work. And it's, it's this control aspect of having, building out your own connections, which is what's vital to a lot of businesses, instead of relying on your third parties to deliver it. But it's the balance, there's a key balance point here is that once you start to connect your data centers together, you have to make a decision about how you do purchasing. And I know that, um, Randy alluded to this here where he said you've got to be able to find a purchasing model where there's a capital purchase price of building your own bandwidth and your company has to be willing to take that on board and then there's whereas a carrier just charges you a monthly fee over a contracted interval and we'll talk more about the financial part but building out bandwidth for a lot of people is about getting control of how you provision it and what that provisioning looks like and then also during the service of it and the operation of it. How is the circuit performing? What does the end-to-end -end performance look like? And in a normal environment where you're purchasing bandwidth from a carrier, from a third party, you have a very limited set of tools and very limited set of um, opportunity to impact the performance of the connectivity. And that end-to-end -end visibility is really key for enterprises going forward because, for example, if you're running a VMware environment with a virtualization cluster, you can't have the latency between the two sites get beyond 50 milliseconds. That's your maximum target. And if you can't maintain that and assure yourself that at absolute guarantee of that time frame, then you've got a problem. Now, in a carrier environment, transitional issues, you know, temporary issues can occur and it goes out of control, but you've got very limited ways of monitoring it. So it's not just about the cost aspects, it's also about the ownership aspects, the value that you derive from being able to own your circuits for critical services, for you know the vitality of your operational infrastructure, that is, it, it's it's that's an important part as well. Mm. Randy, is there a kind of a security and compliance angle here as well that factored into it for you, or or that wasn't a key thing? I, I think the principal reason that we that we look at uh, dark fiber and and uh, packet and optical networks are are really the flexibility that it gives us to address uh, quickly developing situations in addition to the other things I've mentioned. So, uh, you know, as, as was mentioned, the, there's a certain amount of time it takes to negotiate a commercial arrangement with a carrier. We're seeing our, our carrier partners become uh, very focused on, on their cost efficiency of their organization. They've, many of them have moved to just-in-time inventory models for their own uh, network equipment and uh, have pretty tight financial controls uh, when they're placing new capex into their networks. Uh, we're finding that as we order larger bundles of circuits, for example, in the quantity of 10 or 16 uh, circuits at a time, we may exhaust all of the national stock that a 
carrier has for their metro network systems, and we may in fact cause them to have to go back to their supply chain organizations to source parts. So it's not been uncommon recently that we see significant delays in delivering uh, circuits even in a metro environment because we've exhausted the capacity of the carrier to uh, get equipment to light new waves on their metro networks. Uh, we, we can choose with a, a packet optical system uh, like that from BTI, we can choose how much we inventory in-house and those, those in cards can be placed in several different metropolitan networks uh, that we have. So we have the flexibility to better address uh, the risk and reward of, of keeping inventory on hand and having flexibility to address our growth uh, very quickly. Eve, has it, um, this is a bit of a naive question, but just in case there's other people out there wondering like me, <clears throat> has it um, always been possible for um, <clears throat> for companies like Colos and, and content providers and sort of independent businesses to, to buy dark fiber, I, you know, or was it once just the purview of, you know, carrier to be in this space or ha has it, wh why is buying dark fiber now a, a, an, an option or has it always been there and it's just that the trend is increasing? Well, I think there's actually um, two, two sort of trigger points. The dark fiber has, has been there for quite a while. Um, I mean, I think for 10 years and because there is so much of it in, in a lot of areas, the price has come down um, and there's a lot there to be offered. So, so yes, it is fairly available in most areas. Um, I mean, the, the other trigger point is that the equipment has become a lot easier to install. Um, you know, in the old days, installing some packet optical equipment was far more difficult for anybody except for a service provider who had large technical teams. Uh, now the teams are smaller, the products are far easier to install and far easier to provision and actually are, are much more feature rich. So it makes it a little bit easier now for um, a team to go and build their own network with a much smaller team in, internally. That's a good point there, Eve, is about the operation of it, is that 10 years ago running an MPLS core over an optical backbone was a mystical science and it was only done by those blessed magicians who were able to do that. But in the last decade we've seen those skills filter down into the general engineering uh, teams around the world and it's certainly much more possible for you know people to build their own networks and run them reliably uh, as MPLS particularly has become a core competency for most of people's staffing in the engineers. So that's certainly one side of it. And there's also the increase in reliability of the equipment itself. So newer equipment, the Metro Ethernet gear, the you know, the optical components that goes in, the reliability of that has gotten up to the point where it's actually doesn't require intensive maintenance like, you know, seven or eight years ago your optical gear required it really specialized skills to keep that thing running. And you had to have really tuning on to the, you know, mapping the loss signaling on the fiber and stuff like that. Over time, the equipment's gotten much smarter and much more quality about able to handle that, and that's made operating it a lot simpler than it used to be. And, you know, I mean, this is where, as, as Andy alluded to, Randy alluded to a little while ago, he's saying, you know, at Rackspace, they buy circuits, you know, 12s and 16, 10s or 40 gigs at a time and can exhaust the available stock of your bandwidth. I, mean, I think that's pretty awesome that Rackspace can do that because it also encourages the carriers to invest in their networks for the rest of us. But for normal people, uh, when I say normal, I mean for companies who are thinking about lighting up optical networks between their data centers to get high bandwidth and reliability, it's also about creating new services over those optical bandwidth as well. So once you've got one dark fiber between a site and you can mux 10 or 16 10 gig circuits on that single fiber pair, you can choose to light up multiple services there. So you actually gain flexibility about being able to run storage traffic over this one and and you know a different type of traffic over this this lambda as well so the the, the technical considerations are you know this ability to co to create varied levels of service even within that as well and that operational issue is about how do you simplify the operation of it so that it's practical to run and those two things have evolved over time in my opinion 
Randy, is that, uh, is that, are, are you at that stage yet of sort of doing, you know, being more flexible in terms of the services that you're offering, you can offer using the dark fiber? Well, we certainly have a multi-service network, uh, MPLS, uh, in our metropolitan networks and between our data centers uh, uh, on a national basis in the U.S. and connecting to the U.K. I, I don't want to pre-announce any, any uh, product decisions, uh, but certainly we're always looking at ways to uh, offer additional services that are complementary to the hosting services we provide and uh, are looking at our, our network as a, an additional platform that we can provide services on. Cool. So, so I know um, you know you have uh, lots of thoughts around the financial considerations. Can you dig into that a little bit for us, sort of help people think through the financial issues of doing this? It's obviously not a small undertaking to go ahead and like light up your own dark fiber. Um, what are your thoughts on that piece of it? Sure. In, in the case of dark fiber, um, the placement of the fiber by the carrier is, is quite an extensive and, and uh, expensive opportunity for the carrier to invest in a very long-term way. Uh, much of the fiber that has been placed in metropolitan areas w was done so in, in what we'll call the telecom boom. And to a large extent, that surplus of dark fiber continues to exist, although it may not exist directly to the front door of your data center. There is often some on and off ramps that need to be built by the carrier to provide you the dark fiber service. What we've done is when we open a new data center or when we're looking at uh, re renewing a lease on a major data center, we look at the, the fiber uh, lease effectively on a similar nature that we would leasing or buying a data center. Uh, we try to align the terms of our fiber with uh, similar terms that we might do for data centers. And, and the rationale is to simply minimize the recurring cost or the cost overall by making a long-term commitment to with the carrier. Uh, these are effectively a time money trade-off and it also means that for the life of that data center lease uh, we would then have a similar arrangement for fiber and assures our supply. Uh, we would typically take a look at our capacity forecast, uh, estimate a cost for leasing that bandwidth. We've traditionally saw a decline in market pricing over time so we usually assume a uh, decl uh, declining price during the, the time that we're modeling and would do a relatively simple present value calculation on build versus buy and then add in the softer components like the flexibility it gives us um, the capability to trade bandwidth for efficient use of data centers. An example might be that if you've lowered the cost of bandwidth between your first and second data center in a market you could then decide to put certain applications like a new storage array in your other data center because the cost of network to access it is, is much lower than leasing. So it, 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 the capability of the packet optical network in the, in the metro environment enables uh, creative plays in real estate space management which has been very effective for us as well. Interesting. And presumably you need a pretty good sort of capacity planning to be able to, to do this. Well, you know, I've, I've worked at some large companies and some small companies, and I can honestly say that capacity planning is as much art as it is science. Uh, mm -hmm. Understanding the demands uh, from your businesses and how that drives capacity is, is really difficult. Uh, new applications are not typically well understood, and they either use much less than forecast or much more. So the flexibility to have a network that can grow fast so that you can quickly turn up more capacity after you've launched a new service and you've identified that it needs a lot more capacity. It turns out to be quite an advantageous uh, thing in this environment where capacity plans pretty much universally are very difficult to, uh, to make accurate. Right, I'll just and, add something uh, to that, if I may. It, it, the prediction of bandwidth, everybody assumes that capacity planning is a science and it's actually much more like art as Randy alluded to. I think that I find uh, in my experiences on the ground, you can pretty much predict where you're going through from a gut feel and take that forward to the CIO and you can make a verbal case. You don't necessarily have to have some you know, charts and graphs be able to make it. You can really just go to the CIO and say, how much growth do you think the company is planning for in the next five years? 
And the answer is always 20% per, per year, of course, which is 150% growth over five years. So you can very easily go back to the, to the numbers and say, today I'm spending this much on my interconnect bandwidth between two data centers. It's going to grow by 150% over the next five years. So on this pricing, it's going to be 150% more. And that gives you a very quick way to rough up a pricing and go back to the executive with a summary paper to say, here's your spend over this time frame. Here's how you, um, but if we were to build our own, we could just, it would come in at the same cost, you know, or whatever the cost might be, you know, get some dark fiber deploy, project costs and so forth, and very rapidly show a use case where there's benefits both, you know, as we talked about a minute ago, operationally there's benefits, there's certainty, but most importantly, um, there's a guaranteed cost. So for all that, a lot of people talk about OPEX being bad. There's also certain business models in the world where CapEx is the right choice. And there are companies for whom spending money on buying DCI and putting the technology in place is absolutely the best way for them. And those companies should be looking not at using carriers for the DCI because buying big, big fat pipes, big chunks of bandwidth is very restrictive. So um, I guess, I'd like to throw a question over to Eve. I mean, Eve, what sort of qu what sort of bandwidths does the BTI product throw together on a single dark fiber? For the people in the audience who may not know how much bandwidth you can extract from a single fiber, what sort of bandwidth are we talking about? Um, well, you know, one of our 14RU chassis will support 3.36 terabits, um, and you can put three of them in a seven-foot rack. Uh, and bring them together for just about 10 terabits worth of capacity. I would say that the, the largest providers out there are looking for something that can support five to eight terabits of capacity today uh, and then you know be able to grow to 10 or 12 uh, in the future. So that's mm -hmm. what we're hearing from our from our largest um, customers. but then there are other customers that are, you know, really only connecting with 20 to 40 gig today, um, but they do see that it's it's going up and are at that trigger point. Um, so it's really a, a wide variety of mm -hmm. of what the capacity needs are. Clearly, as you require more capacity, I think the savings become far more compelling. Actually, it'd be great, uh, Randy, for you to go through what were the sort of Key items or costs that you looked at, and where did you where did you have significant savings uh, when you built out the network yourself? Sure, happy to. Uh, we've we've now we're now heading towards eight of our ten data centers globally being connected with this sort of uh, operation uh, in terms of fiber and packet optical equipment. But uh, one of our larger centers uh, in Texas. Um, one of the surprising uh, cost savings were actually the taxes and surcharges that were placed on leased waves. So in some jurisdictions across the U.S., there is a, a universal service charge, which tends to be more of a national uh, fee, uh, universal service fund. Um, and then there tends to be state and city level taxation that is applied on some telecom services. So in some of our cases, in the particular case, uh, that we had in, in, the, in the Dallas metropolitan area, uh, some of our circuits were taxed as much as 20% above the price we negotiated with uh, service charges uh, on top. So it, it was important to look at the invoice and not necessarily just the contracts when we were doing our analysis of cost. And uh, we found that the taxation piece made our, our case in, uh, in Dallas that much better um, because the, we still, of course, pay all the appropriate taxes, but the value of the leasing of the fiber um, is uh, a set price and uh, does not grow like the cost of, of circuits. We're buying the capital equipment, which would be the, uh, the packet optical gear to light it. We've been, become very efficient in, in looking at those uh, sorts of costs. This may not be an obvious one for network engineers to, to look at, but it's key to go look at the cost of, of your circuits from an invoice and not necessarily from your contract because the price you negotiate with the carriers is often just the, the, uh, the base price of the circuit. So d does your uh, OPEX cost go up, Randy? I'm, I'm sorry, with the, with the OPEX cost of which, please? 
so in, in building your own network, the sort of assumption would be that your operating costs overall go up. Was that, was that the case for you guys? Oh, um, I mentioned earlier in one of the considerations of purchasing dark fiber is uh, how your company prefers to treat the expenditure of capital versus uh, operational funds. So there are a couple of different ways to acquire dark fiber. One is uh, certainly on a recurring lease basis, and you might contract with a carrier for one, two, three, or five years, or, or even longer, on a recurring monthly payment. Uh, a second way of, of accomplishing that is effectively like a capital lease. Um, in telecom terms, it's often called an indefeasible right of use, uh, which is really an upfront capital payment for a fiber. Uh, you own it effectively, or the use of it, for a very long time. 15 years is a very common term, 20 years. And then there is a yearly operation and maintenance charge uh, for the ongoing maintenance of the fiber plant. Um, that tends to be a, a percentage of, of the total cost. So in our case, uh, we've done both leasing and uh, IRU models. And we, we look at it in our financial modeling and make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. How long do we have the data center leases for? What does our capacity forecast look like? How comfortable are we for 10 or 15 years? Or is this something where we think we'll have major change in five years? And we make a decision. And that allows us to uh, consider whether we should be doing an OPEX model, uh, where we're leasing the fiber on a monthly recurring basis, or if it would be better to, to use some of our capital and uh, take a longer term view in the market, and, uh, and in doing so, often reduce our OPEX uh, to a much smaller amount. Can you share any numbers around there on savings or, or not? Um, you know, uh, I, I think um, it would be hard to, to share specific numbers, uh, but we were successful in some of our largest metros in doing a three and five year model. And in the three year case, in one of our larger metros, uh, developing a dark fiber and uh, packet optical uh, deployment that had a return for us in 15 to 18 months. So I uh, don't want to get too specific uh, because of you know the proprietary nature of some of that data for both uh, ourselves and our providers. But we had no trouble creating a business case where the upfront purchase of fiber on a long-term lease and equipment created a return in, in as short uh, as 15 months. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting. So how about uh, how about some of the operational considerations? Obviously, now you know when you're purchasing purchasing leased waves, you know the carrier is responsible for you know. For for all the outages and the, the reliability of that network. Now this, that's on you. So how do you actually sort of think about that? I, I think the principal, uh, principal differentiation from an operations standpoint is uh, network engineers familiar with operating fiber equipment in a data center have a pretty forgiving environment. Uh, you can use a ethernet switch that's good for 10 kilometers over fiber and when you're using it for hundreds of meters inside a data center, uh, your attention to detail around fiber cleanliness and handling of fiber um, is, is fairly forgiving. When you uh, move to a model where you're using carrier fiber um, and a little bit higher powered optics and working over a li little longer distances, you know, 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers, um, attention to detail around optic cleanliness is very important. And uh, that's something I've, I've experienced in, in uh, all of the, the cases and companies where I've, I've worked with um, this sort of equipment over the last 10 years. Taking an IP network person and transitioning them into running an optical network is relatively straightforward. Uh, it involves uh, more attention to detail around fiber and understanding of the principles of the system, possibly some new test equipment uh, that you might need. Uh, and then um, uh, operational considerations, uh, understanding what you've negotiated with your carrier around reliability of that fiber. Um, you take on more responsibility for the engineering and, if you will, the math around how your network operates. Uh, you'll need to make sure that you have designed adequate redundancy for the application that you're running. And also looking at how things such as maintenance are handled. So it's common that uh, a city might wish to relocate a roadway 
and a carrier might have to relocate the fiber cable that your fiber is on. You need to have a network design that can allow for a carrier requesting an outage from you for maintenance reasons, uh, requesting an outage maybe to relocate a fiber, and for that reason it's pretty typical that you would have an additional path in your network to carry the traffic in case one of the fiber routes failed. And in larger environments, you may even go to three or four paths in your network to ensure that you always have um, the highest reliability and that the users of your network do not see any impact even when there is planned maintenance um, or other, other risks occurring. So just, just on the sort of uh, reliability front, you mentioned something called for any sort of IP networking engineers that may not be so familiar. What do you mean by optical cleanliness? Um, it's really the practices that you might use in um, turning up a system. So tools which IP engineers might not have used before are um, a, no, a fiber microscope. And the purpose of a fiber microscope is to look at the end of the fiber cable, the patch cable, and to ensure that there's no debris on the end of the connector. Um, in a data center environment, the, the power that the equipment uses relative to, to the distances are such that it's not that uh, significant an issue inside data centers, but certainly as you tend to work over longer distances, 30 or 40 kilometers instead of tens of meters, um, optical cleanliness is important to the success of the overall uh, program. Another, another option uh, to consider would be you might use uh, field terminated uh, on-site polished connectors in your data center, or you might be familiar with multi-mode uh, fiber in your data center. It takes just a little bit of uh, understanding and uh, practice to, to uh, deal with these issues when you're working between data centers in a metro network. It's certainly not insurmountable. There are many great companies out there that can also do this work for you um, as professional services with your optical vendor or um, as others. If I, if I could just expand on that, for those people who are unaware with it, normally people just have a fiber optic cable and they plug it in and they think that's perfectly good enough. And as Randy says, inside of a normal data center, you have what's called a 20, you have a fiber loss budget of around about 20, 25 dB. That means that from the time the signal is launched out of the equipment to the time it's received at the other end, you can lose a very lot, a lot of signal. But because the distance inside the data center is so small, it's effectively insignificant. You don't need to perform good hygiene, which is to, well, most enterprises don't perform good hygiene, which is to clean the fibers when they go in. They don't ensure the cable's not being vibrated. There's a whole bunch of good practices inside the data center don't make a lot of sense. Financially and operationally, they're hard to do. But when you get into long haul where you're launching a signal, a fiber optic signal into a cable, and it has to run for 40, 50, 100 kilometers, every every element of loss becomes significant. So every patch to patch where the fiber optic gets spliced to another fiber optic, every patch panel, if a tiny piece of dust, just you know, ambient dust in the atmosphere gets on the end of the patch lead that you're putting in, you could actually lose five kilometers off a run and hmm. off a cabling run. And if that five kilometers is the important part, you know, it, it's the bit that you need right now, then you've got a major problem because your optical circuit may not work correctly and you need to have equipment to do that. Now I think this might be a good question to say to Eve is you know do you have models that your customers have for, for operating this and to and are there features in the equipment that help you detect this sort of capability and, and the servicing of this? Uh, that's a great question Greg. Um, we do have a model um, like like we were talking about earlier, it definitely depends on um, the spans, the distances, the number of data centers, but um, we have a model where you can put in the number of spans, the number of data centers you want to interconnect with um, 10 gig links, uh, and what the cost would be for the managed service, uh, and use um, a percentage based on sort of the additional taxes to calculate what that cost would be over a period of three or 10 years. Um, and then we have a comparison of purchasing leased fiber, which you can um, basically depreciate over 10 or 20 years, or as some content providers do, actually amortize that uh, at a much faster rate over a couple of years. Uh, so both of those uh, can be done in comparing the cost. Um, what ends up happening for 
really three to about 10 year period of time in almost every model that we do based on the managed waves, uh, it comes out to about 60% savings. Uh, so you've got a huge amount of savings going with a build-it-yourself network um, over all of those years. Um, and that can vary. It actually can get better in certain areas. For instance, the, the lease lines in New York City are as much as thirty to $50,000 uh, for 10 gig waves. Uh, they're, they're nowhere that high in the Midwest. Um, they could actually be you know, 10% of that number. And so no matter which way you go on, on the pricing of the managed waves, uh, the fiber and the original cost still kind of come out to about at least a 60% saving. But like I said, it varies by city. Um, we're, we're happy to share with any customers out there you know, our TCO model uh, if they'd like to sort of work the elements that they have. It's, it's really only a couple of inputs um, that are required. It's fairly easy. Cool. And actually, let's go. ask the audience. So uh, we want to launch a poll here on the sort of financial piece of this uh, this question. So, have you done a TCO or feasibility analysis yet to um, to build versus buy? Uh, quite, uh, possible answers: No, not no, not yet. I need some help, and and yes, all set. Um, it seems. Randy, it seems like actually just thinking about sort of the reliability piece again for a minute. Have you noticed uh, sort of a difference? I mean, are you able to actually um, have a more reliable network in terms of outages than than when you um, when you were leasing lines? Um, have you seen any? Do you have any data points around that? Have you have you noticed any change there? I think. I think it's relatively uh, early yet for us to to say with respect to to rack space, um, you know, errors and 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 uh, failures in telecom are something measured in time, and you would typically need two or maybe three years to really assess that. Uh, it's been my it's been my experience uh, in in other projects that yes, indeed, uh, the reliability overall of the network went up. Um, you do see more visible. You have more. You have more visibility into what's going on in the network. So you may see more um, issues being raised, not necessarily failures, but you may see uh, more things that you consider a threat to your network. But that's not because um, necessarily that there are any more threats to your network with fiber and packet optical than there were with a carrier service. Uh, typically, the operations function in a carrier will assess whether something is important enough to notify a customer. And you just may not see those uh, kinds of threats to your network when you're buying a carrier service because someone at the carrier is deciding what to let you know about. Um, so I, I would say that we're expecting to have uh, both A, greater visibility, and B, probably greater reliability, although our network reliability is pretty good anyway. Uh, we've done some careful analysis on how many fiber paths we need in our network for the operational model that we have. And in one case, we chose to uh, implement two sets of optical gear um, in the metro uh, because we felt that we would like a concurrently maintainable system. Uh, so what that means is that we have two identical sets of gear in each of the data centers and POPs. And we know that because of the critical nature of the customers we host in those data centers, we are able to uh, schedule maintenance on one of those systems while leaving the other complete system uh, uh, alone, including having a separate network management system for it. And we were able to do that cost effectively in that market at lower costs than leasing waves. So we're very pleased about the what we think is additional availability that we've built into our system by doubling up on very cost effective equipment and uh, enabling uh, a better maintainability model than uh, leasing from, from carriers. Now, we still lease a considerable amount. Uh, it's not that we're replacing, for example, intercity networks at this time, um, but certainly in the metro environment, we see this as a, a critical thing for all of our metros really globally. That's interesting. So um, just uh, sharing the, uh, the results here from the poll, so uh, almost 20% of, of uh, our audience here 
um, actually have done a TCO or feasibility analysis around building versus buying. Uh, a little under 10% need more help, but presumably interested, and the rest, uh, no, not yet. So again, this is sort of like quite audience, you know, who's sort of, you know, on the less on the sort of trailing edge of, of doing this, but um, it's interesting to see almost 20% are actually already there. Um, so moving on to the, the sort of final section um, of our topic here, and Randy, kind of leaning on you a little bit again um, with your experience in doing this, um, you know, talk about the sort of contractual sides of it a bit, but, you know, with your dark fiber provider, what are the issues there to make sure that you have kind of a good contract in place? Sure. I think the key thing is to uh, check your diversity. So uh, the route diversity of your fiber network is critically important. Um, and it's beholden on the buyer to make sure that you have proven the route. So if you're connecting two data centers in a relatively straightforward network, you might have two separate fiber paths. It's important that you verify which entrances the fiber are, will enter each of your data centers and that the provider has given you a map that you can verify the complete physical diversity of the network, that there is no uh, single points of failure with your fiber uh, paths. You should have at least two of them. Uh, depending on your maintainability model, you might even want more uh, paths, but two is typically the, the case. Um, you need to uh, understand how often and how frequently the carrier might want to request a maintenance release on your fiber. And uh, from time to time, the carrier will be given a notice to relocate the fiber. Perhaps the utility is changing its electrical pole. There needs to be some work done on the fiber. Perhaps a municipal authority is relocating a roadway. You need to understand how long those maintenance activities will be. You probably want to address uh, the requirement with your fiber provider that they don't undertake maintenance on both sides of your fiber at the same time. There are a few things that you want to think through about the operational aspects and make sure that you have that included in your in your contract, in addition, of course, to, to finding a price that works. Um, I would suggest if you if, if it's your first time through this, you might want to encourage uh, uh, you know getting someone that is familiar with this sort of contract to assist you with it. Um, your your in-house Council may not be familiar with the nature of dark fiber and, and bringing in some additional expert knowledge might be uh, advisable on your first uh, first go at this. Right. Any other uh, advice there, um, Greg, for people sort of you know, on the potential drawbacks to, to getting going with it? Yeah, so I agree with what Randy said, of course, of you have to own the design. In part, if you're outsourcing to the carrier, the carrier then gets to provide you with a service. They're contractually obliged to give you 10 gigabits per second at this. And you don't have to worry about how that actually gets done. That's all done by somebody else. So once you bring in this, you have to own the design and how it fits into your network. Now, if that sounds scary, it's actually not because you're already doing most of the work anyway with connecting your data center core to the optical edge. And it's not a huge amount of work to take on this new skill set. Now, part of that is because the newer equipment is easier to use, and partly due to the change in technology recently, where we talk about software defined networking, it's driving um, the new vendors to come up with ways of driving their hardware with software platforms. Unlike the old days where everything was done, you know, with a magic hand wave and pressing keys and esoteric commands, modern optical equipment comes with graphical consoles that are useful and easily understood. But you still own the design, you still own the deployment. So as Randy said, you should bring in somebody who has some expertise with optical and this, this unique part, especially around the physical nature of the optical cable, to advise you on that. There are certain parts of the optical equipment which actually are doing more and more of the work for you. So in the past, the optical equipment was always just literally it connected the the, the interfaces onto the optical and they did nothing. It was very much like a mux arrangement for those of the old people in the audience or remember it's just like it passes the signaling through. The modern equipment is becoming more capable. It's actually beginning to participate in the network. So um, the vendors are now enabling MPLS 
not BGP, not IP, but just taking the MPLS signaling and taking that in as part, which makes it easier for you to integrate it into your core. So where you bridge the data center network into the optical edge becomes easier. Um, Randy opens up a good issue there about fiber maintenance. It hadn't occurred to me before that you know, your fiber path, once you actually have a dark fiber, it does actually still need maintenance. It's not something that I had uh, come across before and it's making me think you know, operationally how you do those things. But I guess the flip side is um, that the, the skill set um, that people need to learn in the optical is not, a, is not a million miles away from the skill set that many of your engineering staff already have in the land. So you know, maybe they've got to learn 25% you know, more of, of, an, of a knowledge base in a particular discipline. But if your network is already that big, that's not a huge ask of that team and to, to move that into the operational structure of the network in any case. That's a, I would that's a good that, point, Greg. And go ahead, I would, I would, yeah, I would add that um, in some cases, the optical equipment vendor uh, will assist you in, in, a, in helping address some of these issues. For example, uh, you know, the fiber specifications, uh, loss per kilometer and the type of parameters your optical equipment vendor is obviously motivated to assist you in, in helping buy their equipment and they quite often provide really good sales engineering assistance around uh, scoping those parameters that you need. Uh, so they can assist you with that and in some cases uh, dark fiber providers will actually take on additional levels of maintenance and support of your system. A different model is that you might contract with your dark fiber provider to actually provide the fiber and they might as well provide first line maintenance on your optical system. A managed optical network is commonly the way that's described. So I think the key thing, out of, if, if you take maybe a couple of things away from, from the webinar today, having the ability to build your financial model for build versus buy, then enables you to understand the cost of building the network, which is not that different than the cost of a telecom provider serving you. It, is, it assists in you understanding uh, the cost to lease, it, it understands whether you've got the capacity needs to drive building the network, and you become a, a much more informed customer, even if you do choose to then lease circuits after having done that. And then with respect to addressing the operational parameters, while we've addressed some of the issues that you might face, there are ways that you can have a provider, one of your providers, either the dark fiber provider who may operate locally in the market you're in, or perhaps your optical equipment vendor, do some of the first line maintenance and operations of the equipment, uh, either for a short time or for the life of the system, uh, while your team and, and organization kind of comes up to speed on that new technology. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and I think one of the things is that once you start building out your data center interconnect, you know, one of the things that you can do is actually start building on that and enable some application awareness, which can give you even more visibility to the network than you had before. I mean, where things are going, as Greg uh, alluded to with SDN and NFB, I think the real key is getting um, some automation back into the network and get some provisioning, faster provisioning. In the cases of services and monetizing the network, it's just so important to be able to provision your links faster than you ever did before in order to get revenue earlier. And, you know, if that gets pushed out and pushed out for whatever reason, then your ability to recognize revenue just takes so, that much longer. So I think anything that can help you, which is usually a level of analytics and programmability uh, to provision services faster is going to be uh, a much better monetization of the network that you've put in place, even if it only starts at the optical layer. Greg, do, do you think over time um, more companies are, are going to be doing this or is it sort of you know, do you think it's going to be exclusively for sort of very giant enterprises and colos and, and content providers? How do you see the trend sort of playing out here over the next few years? It, Greg, are you there? He might have dropped off. 
No, it's complicated. I was it's sitting there mulling over my answers to some extent. It's we're seeing. I mean, against the background, there's two things happening here. One is a lot of enterprises are getting larger, and their demands for bandwidth are getting higher. So they need to move into this environment to manage their costs over the long term. But at the same time, we're seeing the drive into the cloud. So sometimes companies are saying, well, instead of investing in my WAN, why don't I move a service into a cloud provider? Which, of course, drives the cloud provider market, who then go and buy the same equipment that the enterprise would have bought to support the cloud. Uh, so yeah, I do think that as private cloud technology start to take off, so the market is predicting, you know, today we're seeing companies move to the public cloud, but the technologies that make the public cloud sexy and exciting are also coming down to private, so they're coming down into the enterprise space. And, and we're seeing private cloud technologies enable new services that look like public clouds to come in and, and be valuable to businesses. If, if the private cloud in the enterprises and the big companies takes off, then we're going to see a huge demand for this interconnect bandwidth because that's how we'll do redundancy and resiliency. Companies who have two data centers today need to get really high bandwidth between those facilities so they can have you know, automated failover and, and distribution of services and cloud-like infrastructures in a way that really matters to them. For the same reasons that Randy's outlining for Rackspace, you know, the drive for customers to go to Rackspace is because Rackspace has this bandwidth pre-provisioned, has these services in place. So the question is, do companies go to the cloud providers who can give them these services and this and the unlimited access to bandwidth because, or do they build it themselves and, and enable their own thing or does that happen over, you know, where's the transition there? I don't know. But, you know, the answer always is bandwidth. More bandwidth solves all problems in networking. And this type of technology, this optical technology, provides you with all the bandwidth that you can ever want if you're clever enough to get it into your network. Randy, is there, um, is there an ideal balance um, between lease lines and, and, uh, and buying your own dark fiber? And do you see, for rack space, do you see those proportions shifting? Well, I think we uh, we see that certainly in the metropolitan networks in a given uh, metro area, you know, uh, Dallas or in Ashburn, Virginia or Chicago, where we have m multiple data centers, it makes uh, great sense to have dark fiber between them um, and have done so uh, uh, in, in all of the cities. We're seeing that the ability of carriers to invest in, the, in their network and recover that over time is similar to to our own, and that the equipment uh, um, the equipment depreciation cycle for piece of optical equipment tends to be around five years, which is is longer than the uh, typical uh, return that a carrier would like on that gear. So where we're seeing uh, the most uh, use of dark fiber are in cross sections of our network where we have a larger number of circuits, uh, typically ten gig waves. And in cases where we have certainty beyond three years uh, in our real estate portfolio relating to data centers, so where we have a long-term view on the, on the data center and where we have a large cross-section of bandwidth, uh, it becomes a situation where the, where the business case tends to be very favorable for us to, to invest. There are some other cases uh, where we choose to use lease lines in a metro, but predominantly the metropolitan networks are heading uh, in this direction for, I think, most content and service providers. Uh, between cities, uh, intercity networks, or long haul sometimes called, um, is, is another case where uh, how much bandwidth do you have between those cities, and are you at a stage uh, where it makes sense to acquire that, that fiber? And then secondly, is the fiber available? There has been a tremendous consolidation of availability of fiber. Back in the, you know, 10 years ago, there were several networks building and overbuilding each other. However, a lot of that has been consolidated today. The availability of dark fiber on a national scale in the U.S. is not what it was uh, five or seven years ago. So it's a question of whether it's available uh, and then uh, the capacity that you have on it. And then moving to long haul networks, there's an additional operational complexity uh, with those that is greater than with metropolitan networks. So I think there is a, a metropolitan dark fiber and packet optical or optical network uh, uh, model. And then the intercity one is is really kind of a step beyond that. So I think for the next while, I would expect uh, leasing intercity waves to be fairly common uh, in uh, medium-sized providers. And it's really probably those largest uh, 
content companies that have the national uh, dark fiber networks. Got it. Eve, any, uh, in closing, any last thoughts sort of on the market over the next few years? Presumably the, car <clears throat> the carriers are not ignoring this trend. Uh, perhaps they'll drop, drop their, the pricing on least waves. What do you see, you know, going forward over the next few years here? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, they're they're certainly challenged. Um, the the least wave uh, pricing has not really gone down that much. It does continue to go down, but I still think that there are cost advantages um, that come along with building your own network. And I think the biggest thing really is the control. Uh, the ability to have control over your own network, especially as we move forward with uh, initiating different types of services that I'm, I'm not sure that the carriers are going to all be able to come up with. Um, they are working. I mean, we're talking and we sell to the Tier 1 and Tier 2 and 3 carriers uh, all over North America and Europe already. Um, so they are working too um, to make sure that they are up to speed. Um, but it is a little bit more challenging for them to move, move sort of the big ship around. I think the smaller companies, whether they be uh, vendors or hosting providers or content providers, are a little bit um, more agile and able to move faster. Got it. Thanks for the interesting uh, conversation, you guys. Really appreciate it. Um, for the audience out there, uh, feel free. Uh, to follow up with, with um, our panelists here today and we'll answer any questions that we weren't able to get to. Again, thanks all for tuning in and uh, we'll look forward to the next one. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, guys.